Welcome to the third of three mental health month presentations that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And my name is Mike. I'm with the Mental Health uh, and Wellness Center. And we're located in building 18 down at the health clinic. And we try to uh, have some featured presenters for May. And we have a very special one this week. Um, and we're new service to students. So uh, we've been in existence about a year and we do mental health counseling for students and also addictions counseling. And I'm fairly new to LCC as well. So uh, in my development, there was Center for Family Development and I got to meet Ron Unger there and he's been a mentor ever since. He's a very seasoned presenter, therapist, and uh, an expert on the topic. He's also a peer support uh, mentor as well. So uh, he has a very rich background. I'll let him say a little bit more about his background, but it's our pleasure and honor to welcome to present to you, Ron Unger. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction. All right, so we're gonna be talking about what is psychosis, what causes it, and how do people recover? So I'll, I'll tackle the first part of just like, what is psychosis? Oops. Um, and, and the simplest explanation is that just that it's some combination of, of being disorganized and being out of touch with reality. So I always kind of like start to ask people like, how many of you are completely organized and completely in touch with reality? Um, again, if you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your hand um, using the raise hand function or anybody here, no? So if none of us are completely disorganized and com or uh, if none of us are completely organized or completely in touch with reality, that means that we all share something with people with psychosis. Um, now, usually, um, Psychosis is something that's only labeled once people are like really disorganized and really out of touch with reality, but we all at least have some of those problems. So it's being, it's being kind of like too far out there and disorganization or being out of touch in some way. Um, now, some people prefer the term extreme states because it really brings out the, the fact that it, this is being an extreme of problems that we all suffer anyway. We all have problems figuring out what's real um, and, and what's not. Now, a little bit more um, on that. So this is a, a, another version of what is psychosis. Some of us hear voices or feel paranoid. We get carried away with big ideas or get confused by the world. These experiences are seen as psychosis. So what is it? It used to be thought of just as an illness you were stuck with and it only got worse. This is wrong. The picture's much more hopeful. The term psychosis covers various experiences. Most commonly, these are said to be hallucinations, where you hear, see, or even smell things other people don't. Strong beliefs that other people find challenging, often referred to as delusions. Our thinking may be chaotic. We can feel energetic. Our mood can be all over the place. You might appear blank, disinterested, unmotivated. It may get to the point that you don't look after yourself and you don't sleep or eat properly. This sounds scary, and it can be, but some people find positives in their experiences. Voices can be on our side. Being full of energy and ideas can be exhilarating. It might be part of a spiritual experience, and yet, while we're loving it, other people may be really worried. The experiences we call psychosis are more common than you might think. So why does it happen? Well, there's no simple answer. The best we can figure is it's down to a mixture of things. Stress. The things that happen to us in life, together with the way we make sense of them. The way the world treats us. Racism, abuse, poverty. These things are not our fault, but can take a toll. As with other experiences, our biology and genetics, and how they respond to our environment, may also be a factor. So, what might be helpful 
having supportive relationships with family, friends, or even professionals, meeting with people who have had similar experiences, talking based approaches like therapy, being able to choose a medication that works for you, self help, and help from our communities. We all need choices to feel safe, cared for, accepted, and more so if you've experienced psychosis. We need purpose in our lives, opportunity to nurture self esteem, to feel in charge of our futures, and to have fun. We want you to know that this is not something you're stuck with. There are ways through it, and there are people who understand. That's where our little leaflet comes in. Full of useful information on psychosis, so you can make up your own mind. All right. So that leaflet, as it says, is, is available for free at that link. And you can also um, find that video again if you want to look at it again. So, um, so I'm going to say a little bit about. Um, um, this slide's called a relational definition of psychosis. Um, but there's some interesting things about like how we try to decide who's out of touch with reality and who's not. And, and basically we end up calling some, what's going on with somebody's psychosis when we don't understand their experience or behavior and we don't have a better explanation for why we don't understand them. Because if... You know, let's say you see somebody who's acting in a way you don't understand, but you hear that they're from a different culture and they have some rituals they do there. And this is the day they do those rituals. You might say, I have no idea what they're doing, but I think I have an idea why they're doing something different. So you wouldn't call it psychotic. Um, but sometimes there might be kind of like a good explanation for what the person's doing or, you know, how they're, what they're experiencing or how they're behaving that you just don't know. So it might be the problem more with the, the person doing the labeling and thinking the person is psychotic is, is missing something. So that idea that um, the person you know, in the mental health system or the person who's, who's trying to figure out who's psychotic or not is themselves only partly in touch with reality. And so they don't always get it right. is kind of important because too often I think in mental health, we've been really arrogant when, when we actually look at the history of how we function you know, that we all get mixed up from time to time. And that bringing it into a human level is, is really important, I think, for good work in this field. Um, now, one question, like a lot of people have heard psychosis as, uh, associated with a medical cause. Oh, it's something wrong with your brain. It's, it must be you have faulty genes, um, you know, something like that. Um, and it's clear that the cause can be medical that people get confused and, and illnesses like Parkinson's, you know, brain tumors or malaria are ex examples of things that can push people into psychosis. Um, things that you do that make it hard on your brain, like use a lot of methamphetamines can definitely do it. Um, and, and it's true that some genetic differences appear to increase risk, but you know, that when they've actually looked for genes, they've only found, they found like a hundred different genes that contribute each one a small amount of increased risk. But they can't tell just because someone's had psychotic, is, is psychotic that they have any particular genes or that they necessarily have a genetic vulnerability. So it might be more like sunburn where, you know, some people get sunburned because they're very genetically vulnerable, but other people just because they've been out in the sun too long. Um, and then another reason why people think of it as associated with something medical is they've heard, oh, you can take people diagnosed with something like schizophrenia where they've had a lot of psychosis and they have brain differences. But in fact, um, those brain differences aren't always found. And the brain differences that are found seem to be the same as those are commonly found in people that have been, been abused when they were kids. So it may not be the sign of any unique disease as much as a sign of a lot of stress and trauma and hardship in the person's life. Um, now, um, sometimes the, the kind of explanation people get is like, well, you just have an illness that's causing 
the, the psychosis. But there's a, a problem with that kind of reasoning and it kind of goes like this. You know, the person comes in saying, hey, what's causing me to have these, these weird experiences and, and that sort of thing. And, and maybe the mental health person says, oh, we know what's causing that. It's your illness, which is schizophrenia. But if the person ever then asks, well, how do you know for sure that I have this illness called schizophrenia? The only answer we can offer is, well, we can diagnose you with schizophrenia because you have these weird experiences. It's all kind of circular um, since there is no brain test for, for schizophrenia. Um, I mean, they might as well be saying, you know, well, what's causing these weird experiences? Oh, it's your demon. Well, how do you know I have a demon? Well, you have these weird experiences. That's what causes them. You know, it's just kind of a theoretical kind of thing. So I think it's a lot more helpful to look at, um, you know, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit more, like maybe some of the actual dynamics that are pushing people into having um, difficult experiences. Now, once people, you know, get seen as having psychosis, they run into another problem, which is that of stigma and discrimination, being seen as less than other people. Um, and a lot of people would say that this can end up being a greater barrier to recovery than the problem itself. Um, that, um, you know, like having, you know, people around you no longer trust the way your mind works um, can, can really make it hard to recover and get back, get back into a, uh, a decent place. By the way, when I was talking about the medical thing, there's one thing I, I, I forgot to mention, and that is that a lot of people think that, um, have been told that, well, psychosis, that it must be caused by a biochemical imbalance and that taking a medication is like taking insulin for diabetes. Um, but, you know, while antipsychotics can sometimes be helpful, they aren't helpful in the way insulin is for diabetes. Um, now, if you have high blood sugar and you get the right amount of insulin, your blood sugar always comes down. That's just the way it works. It, it, you know, but taking antipsychotics that block dopamine, I mean, they always block dopamine, but that doesn't necessarily make psychosis less. It seems to work for some people and not for others. There's some of the randomized trials they've done where the antipsychotics didn't even beat out placebo. So it's not, you know, it doesn't have this, it's not, in that way, it's not at all comparable. Um, so that, you know, what causes psychosis is much more complex than a, uh, some kind of dopamine imbalance. Um, but anyway, so the stigma can be a really big problem. But then a lot of times, you know, like, the solution when they say, well, there's what solve the problem with stigma. And they, they think, you know, well, well, we'll solve it. We'll teach the public that these people just can't help it, that there's something wrong with their brain. But in, unfortunately, when they've done the research on how that works, when you teach people that, that the stigma actually gets worse if you just convince people it's just something wrong with their brain. Because, um, the, the general public, if they think, oh, there's just something wrong with these people's brains, they tend to see the people as more dangerous and they want more distance from them. Whereas the people themselves feel more helpless. Oh, there's just something wrong with my brain. There's nothing I can do. Um, so it's really not very effective. Um, yeah, so um, the diagnosed people seen as having less control, being more dangerous and, and helpless to learn or do anything about their mental state, which actually isn't true. Um, so, and look, look at what are some um, alternative explanations for psychosis? Well, one is that it can, you know, um, anything that kind of like confuses us can obviously push us in that direction, which can be something going wrong in our brain, but it can also be a reaction to life events and situations that have been confusing and traumatic. Um, you know, especially something that leads people to feeling chronically unsafe. So, um, you know, it's been found, for example, that if you've got multiple kinds of trauma, you know, in your, in your childhood, the effect, the connection between that and later having psychosis is as strong as the effect between smoking and getting lung cancer. Um, if you have like five different kinds of, of trauma as a child. So, um, 
but but sometimes, I mean, people become psychotic and they don't really have this obvious trauma history. That can happen too. Um, one of the thoughts is that it happens, especially when people are experimenting with different perspectives and mental states while they're trying to solve what they perceive as problems in their life. And these experiments, you know, sometimes go off the rails and cause more problems and people get really lost. Um, and young people, of course, are, you know, the naturally experiment a lot, but that could be one explanation of why psychosis does tend to you know, begin most often in late adolescence or early adulthood, though it can begin at other times. Yeah. So this is a small group. So if people have questions, um, it's fine to um, um, ask something, or if you're on Zoom, you can try um, unmuting yourself and asking a question. Does anybody have a question at this point? Anything said so far? I guess just to quickly clarify, uh, well, I, I guess not. I mean, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so, I'm going again. Oh, another analogy that I kind of like to, you know, like psychosis um, is, is kind of an analogy that. Because often psychosis is, is, is described as losing one's mind. But if you think about it, a mind is to a person kind of like what a, a government is to a nation. You know, a, a government organizes and guides how things get done and how other nations are related to. Um, so I think, you know, um, psychosis, um, a good metaphor for it can be like a revolution within the person. And, and, and some of the dynamics you see kind of like play out that way. Like often in the initial stages, there's, there can be even kind of a sense of euphoria, kind of sense that maybe anything is possible now. Kind of like when you originally, when you throw off an existing government, sometimes there's this euphoria, oh, we can have whatever we want now. But then often chaos comes in if the revolution doesn't go smoothly. Um, and, and you end up with, um, you know, um, different sides fighting each other and fragmentation and, and a lot of um, distress and violence. Um, so what um, you know, we're trying to do is, is, is help people kind of come back together and reorganize and, 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 and put back together a way of making sense of the things because the old way has kind of fallen apart, kind of like a government has fallen apart, but you need to form a new way of of, of putting things together. So that's just an analogy you might find helpful. Um, but now I wanna hear just a little bit from, from this guy, John Reed, about how he first learned that people's experience of oppression often played a role in what gets called psychosis. Um, John later become, became a, a leading research, researcher in the field, but here he talks a little bit about what led him to his understanding, and I think it can be helpful. So a couple of stories that shaped me, uh, both from the same uh, inpatient unit in New York in, in the Bronx. This is an American story for Gail, so it'll make you feel at home, Gail. My, my first job was in the Bronx as a nursing attendant. So there I was at three o'clock in the morning <clears throat> um, with a guy who had not opened his eyes for about a week. Um, and to the extent that he was black and blue from walking into the doors and the walls and and purely out of boredom, not really clinical skills, because I didn't have any, um, out of boredom, I said, Bob, why have you got your eyes closed? And he opened his eyes and put his face right there. And I thought, oh, no, John, wrong question. <laughs> and he said, it's about fucking time one of you assholes asked me that. <laughs> Well, we had all been looking up eye-closed behavior <laughs> in the diagnostic manual to find out what disorder he had so we, so we would know what color pill to give him. And none of us had thought to ask him that. He then explained to me why he had been walking around with his eyes closed. He said, my family put me in here against my will to get insight. And that's what I've fucking well been doing. You have to, you have to think about it in... in 
it wasn't a mature way to deal with his anger, and I wouldn't try it at home or anything, but um, so my first lesson was if you want to know what's going on with somebody, ask them, uh, rather than look it up in a book. And the second, second story from the same inpatient unit, which is not funny, um, was that I was uh, assigned to do specialing, which I, I don't know what it's called here and now, but that's sort of sitting with someone who's acutely suicidal for an hour in shifts to make sure they don't kill themselves. And I don't know who was more scared, that the 20-year-old woman I was locked into the room with or, or the 20-year-old man that I was. We were both pretty freaked out by this. Uh, and I said, because I didn't know what to say, I said, uh, if you'd like to talk to me, that would be really really good, but if you don't, that, that, that's okay too. That's not bad, is it? No, no, no training. Yeah, but she didn't want to talk to me, uh, at least not that first day. Uh, the second day, she said, my, and stopped. The third day, she said, father. I thought, okay, we can do this one word, you know, one word per day. Um, the fourth day, though, she said nothing. And then the following day, she said, me. So now we had my father me. And of course, when we got the family history, the missing word was, was raped. And that taught me many things, uh, in, including the way that people tell you stuff uh, without telling you. They tell you stuff symbolically or ambivalently because they don't know whether they can trust you, and it comes out in all sorts of ways, um, not always directly. Um, this woman, of course, had catatonic schizophrenia because she hadn't spoken for six months, so we knew what was wrong with her. There was something called catatonic schizophrenia, which was causing her to be silent. And how do we know that? Well, that's what people with catatonic schizophrenia do, you see. It's a backward circular logic, which is, with no offense to five-year-olds, that's how five-year-olds kind of think. So, that's what he's saying. It's, we're better off trying to actually understand what's going on with particular people and what may have led them to where they're at and not um, like looking it up in a book or just using a diagnostic label as the explanation. Um, now, there's plenty more I could talk about possible causes of psychosis, um, but I, I wanna start talking a little bit about what to do about it and how to help people recover. Um, but be, before I get, too far into that, I'd ask, well, how much progress are we actually making in that field, um, especially with mainstream treatment? Um, and that's where kind of unfortunately, we can. it's not good at all. Um, now, there's different ways of, of putting this together, but this is a, a graph of an analysis of number, a number of studies that was published in a prominent journal and it, it shows actually the way it was measuring recovery, it shows recovery higher um, before antipsychotics were introduced because they weren't really introduced until 1955. That's when the first one came in. Um, and we've actually been going downhill. Now, I'm not sure if we brought it up to date, like maybe some early intervention programs are turning it around a little bit, um, but it, does suggest looking at this kind of a graph that, hey, maybe you know, um, bringing in medication wasn't the big um, cure all we were we were hoping it was going to be. Um, this is a really um, tricky issue. Um, you know, it's it's possible to write books about what should and shouldn't be the wise use of antipsychotic drugs. Um, but here's just my thoughts on it. Again, these are controversial. You could hear other people say different things, but after being in the field for a few decades and um, you know that antipsychotic medication often does make a quick impact in, in reducing psychosis, often, not always. Um, but it, I, I think the, the evidence, it's harder to research long-term effects, but the, what, to the extent we can, that doesn't really seem like they're they're great. There's not only unhealthy side effects, but it seems like the long-term risk of psychosis may actually go up when we, reduce, when we um, rely on antipsychotics. So what do I think are the wiser strategies? Well, one thing is sometimes if it's not clear you absolutely need the drug, try other approaches first. And then when you do try it, maybe you know, use it kind of sparingly and then maybe once people are doing better, consider careful and slow attempts to get off 
be open to that. Hey, maybe you don't need this forever. Yeah, it's risky to try to get off, but maybe it's worth trying and try to help people get off successfully. And again, I'm not, I don't know, we don't know for sure who might succeed in getting off and who might not, but that's something that I, I think is worth, worth something as part of efforts towards recovery. Um, now this slide, um, some of you might recognize this message. This, this is the message that and when Dante was writing about souls entering hell, they would encounter this message, all hope abandoned ye who enter here. Um, and you might wonder, well, what the heck does that have to do with mental health treatment? Well, unfortunately, because many professionals want people to think of themselves as having a lifelong mental illness, so they'll never stop trying to take their drugs, they actually convey this message and, and try to reinforce this message. You have a lifelong illness, you're, you know, you're always going to have this, you're always going to need the drugs. But that can really make people feel hopeless about doing anything themselves. In fact, um, Oryx Cohen, um, he, he lived in Eugene at one point. Um, but when he first got diagnosed with psychosis, he says the way people talked to him about it made him feel like he lost his membership in the human race. Um, like basically he was never going to be a person like everyone else in control of his life. He'd always have to take these medications that he hated. Um, now, fortunately, he found other people that helped him not believe that message. And since then, he's you know, made a recovery and he's you know, married and has kids and is uh, chief executive officer of the National Empowerment Center. So he's doing quite, quite well. Um, and, and no, he's not relying on antipsychotics. He did have one slip up a few years ago. We slipped back into a psychosis, but he came back out of it. Um, so, so anyway, I think that we, one of the first things we need to do is keep hope alive and, and keep aware of the uncertainties that, hey, you know, it's, we can't guarantee that, you know, we know exactly what people can do to recovery, to recover, but we know that recovery is possible. A lot of people manage it. It is possible. And, and if we help people have hope, that's one thing that will help them probably, um, recover and, and they can consider what might be some wise risks to make when they're trying to recover. Um, so, so I'll talk a little about what might be some of the more hopeful approaches. Um, and I mentioned before early intervention, like in, in, they have early intervention program in Lane County. You can look up early intervention psychosis Lane County if anybody's looking for that. Um, but I think the, the, the best sort of early intervention was actually developed in Northern Finland. It's now being researched in the UK and to some extent in the United States, but it's called open dialogue. And, um, you know, it's led to really high rates of recovery to the point where, you know, when they, um, in, in the, a, a cohort in a prominent study, most participants were not on disability and were not requiring antipsychotic medications after five years, which is really um, stunning compared to most of what you see um, in, in the United States. Um, and the way it works is as soon as they hear there's a problem, they try to involve the person that's having the problem and their family and their social network in meetings where they just try to talk about what's going on and they have multiple professionals there like two or two or more and um the single goal of their meeting is to create a good dialogue about what's going on their idea is that they can and by good dialogue they mean where uh, more than one point of view is being looked at and people are you know both able to listen to others and um, speak their own point of view um, and the professionals don't come in like they know what's going on. The professionals come in, hey, our job is to make some dialogue happen and get people talking about what it might be, and we'll figure it out together. Um, so here's just a few of their the principles they try to, to go by. Um, you know, respecting everybody. There's something correct about all observations and all feelings. They have something to say. They're, um, and they're all valuable. And, um, and then they try to encourage everybody to express their thoughts and feelings. 
And then also they didn't try to encourage everybody to hear what other people's are. I mean, you don't have to, you know, agree with the others. You just want to hear and know what they are. Um, but that's trying to trying to create create dialogue. Now, one of the things is like when we're kind of freaked out, um, our minds actually go in the opposite direction of trying to be able to understand multiple points of view. Because when we're freaked out, we often are trying to figure out just what's the one right thing to do and push everything else out of our mind. But unfortunately, it's being in that emergency state doesn't allow us to sort things out very well. And people also have this breakdown and in dialogue inside themselves. And that's kind of what this slide is about. Because when people are, are kind of more freaked out, they tend, to, they tend towards one of two extremes, or actually they're usually flip-flopping back and forth. But one of the extremes is where some part of them just takes over, like an emotion or some thoughts or voices. You know, so the person might be feeling down, so they're having some depressed feelings, but then those feelings just kind of take over and they just start believing everything's worthless. Or they're, they're in the grocery store and they start feeling scared and those feelings just take over and they think, I can't be here, I've got to run out of here and leave their car behind. Um, or the voices just tell them what to do. So this causes a lot of problems. This has been called fusion or emotional reasoning or something like that, where some part of you just takes over. Some people call it a parts hijack or part of you takes over. Now that causes so much problems that people then go to the opposite extreme, which is trying to avoid some of their experience. Like if my fearful thoughts take me over and cause trouble, well, maybe I can just completely suppress those, those scared thoughts. I can completely suppress those feelings of anxiety, or I can take drugs until they go away. Um, and, and in that case, we're at the opposite extreme. Now, often it goes back and forth because often we're trying to suppress the fear until it breaks through our defenses and then it just takes over again. And we're, we're back at square one. Now, what we're trying to do in, in good mental health treatment is something more in the middle where, um, you know, the person can be in touch with their different emotions and thoughts and, and, and be aware of where they're coming from, but they don't immediately let them take, take over. So let's say I'm in a certain situation, it feels scary to me. I might realize, wow, this feels scary to me because this situation is kind of similar to one where I was attacked two years ago. But then I might also hear from another part of my brain that says, okay, but this is different than two years ago. And here's a reason why maybe it's okay. And and then I can hear from both sides and I can maybe make a good decision about whether to stay or go. Um, so that's what we're trying to get to internally, the person is having a good dialogue and where they're having a good dialogue with the people in their lives. They're able to speak and listen and, and everybody's able to do that. Um, by the way, another way of summing up the point of this slide, um, there was a, a silly movie um, that had a line that said, um, it said basically feelings are like children. It doesn't work to let them drive the car, but it also doesn't work to lock them in the trunk. And that's a good way to, to remember what we're talking about here. Um, we don't wanna just let our you know, feelings out and just drive us around, but we um, um, also don't wanna lock them away. And, and so that's what more this mindful dialogue is about. Um, I'm going to pause for a minute. Anybody, it looks like um, somebody put a question into the chat. What contribution can marijuana use make in the development of psychosis? Um, that's it. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of research that suggests that especially heavy use of strong pot can push a number of people closer to, to psychosis. Now, marijuana has such different effects on different people, but sometimes it can make people really paranoid and push people towards psychosis. And so that's definitely a thing, especially if that seems to be what the person's reaction is, that maybe they're definitely a person who shouldn't be um, smoking marijuana. And then I recently ran into a woman who, she smoked marijuana for years with no problem, but then once she was, um, decided to quit. And when she quit, 
she got insomnia and then the insomnia led to psychosis. So in her case, it was quitting pot that led to psychosis. So it's, it's all as people's individual story, but it's, marijuana is definitely something to watch out for. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see now if I can get this on the bill again. This one? Or different? Oh, yeah. So I um, was in therapy for a little bit and was on the top of like internal family system. And one of the things that confused me about that, I was like sort of borderline psychosis, but that's a very tame um, parts of marijuana induced. Um, but what I confused me about that was like where the like if i'm listening to all the emotions like the voices that are that i'm hearing and all the emotions that are coming up like where does you know which one is where is the me that has been like facilitating the conversation or like if i'm trying to like balance an emotion with another emotion like who is that character that's happening so then oftentimes that would sort of like not be helpful to me to be like um, like think about that question i don't know if i'm, if I'm making sense but like yeah i would get confused as to which one is the um arbiter you know of those feelings in order to get to a mindful dialogue yeah which who's who's kind of like who gets to judge who's right kind of thing um that itself is probably something you have to have internal dialogue around. It doesn't have like a fixed answer. There's kind of like a a flowing kind of back and forth. And, you know, like it, it is kind of mysterious. How do we come up with an I when we've got like zillions of neurons and, and, and all these different parts of us with different little inputs? And but I think if the process is allowed to just roll along and different sides are you know, allowed to weigh in that that sort of sorts it out. And you can also try to take when you notice there's different sides in you, you can try to to find an ability to step back from all of them and, and tell yourself, well, maybe none of them is perfectly me, but how can I hear the different ones and then allow that decision to kind of like emerge or be sensed or I don't have a yeah. easy way to sum it up it's a complex yeah, question my therapist would often would say where i get to, like she would say like my core self is like where everything is fine like they call it like the the target of the meta or whatever and i struggled with that a little bit because i just a seemed like another personality or whatever but that i'm just labeling it my core self in order to feel better about the discussion, but then I also understood that it was like kind of just a tool to allow everything to happen if you're in like a peaceful place. But yeah, that was definitely something that yeah. yeah. And you know internal family systems is an approach I'm somewhat familiar with. And um one of the ideas is to try to find the place in yourself where you can be kind of like, you know, calm and um, compassionate towards all the different parts of, of yourself. Um, one of the ideas is if you're if you're getting too like um, hooked into one part of yourself that has a certain agenda, like this is the part that knows that I should go, you know, um, move to California, you know, and it is, you know, and other parts of me aren't so sure. Well, if I'm kind of really coming up with a definite agenda this is what i should definitely do and i don't like those other parts so telling me not to go to california well that's not my center really i'm really coming from my center and kind of like realize there's something to each part and i'm open to hearing where they're coming from and open to kind of like try to work out together what the joint what the best path forward might be it's it, it's it's complex it's not easy <laughs> So, um, and of course it gets, it, it can often be really tricky when people are like, 
you know, because people that don't hear voices often hear from various different parts of themselves. You know, there's a part of me that wants to move to California and there's a part of me that wants to stay in Oregon. And there's the part of me that, you know, wants to sell everything and go live on a cruise ship like that one couple that was in the news lately. Actually, I've never been tempted to want to live in a cruise ship. But uh, anyway, but there could be different parts of me. But then some people hear it like voices that are being really demanding or telling them things. Um, and so that, so one thing that's emerged, and this kind of relates strongly with the, 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 um, the movement to try to approach psychosis differently, is this thing called the hearing voices approach. Um, and it started with just one person who was hearing voices and she was taking all the medications her psychiatrist would, would give her and she was still having lots of problems with the voices and he was just telling her they weren't real and to ignore them. And two is like, hey, you know, you, you, you pray to a God that you can't see or hear and think that's real. And I hear these voices every day and you're telling me they're not real. You know, what's, what's up with that? <laughs> and how come you can't help me? And so he actually took that seriously. And so he's like, well, I'll go on TV and ask for other people that know what to do. <laughs> and this was an, an, you know, a Dutch psychiatrist. So I was over there. But you know, went on TV and all these people wrote in about their experiences hearing voices and some of them were doing fine with the voices. And so then they had this idea of just having people get together and share perspectives and ideas about what's going on. Um, and they basically came up with this idea that hearing voices in itself is not, um, should not be considered an illness or psychosis. It's just a human difference like being left-handed or gay but it's only when people have difficulties in their relationship with the voices that they might need help. So um, there are um, hearing voices groups that meet in Lane County and one group is free and open to everyone. I'll have a link at the end to that or there's the information I guess is on the link right there. Um, um, by the way, um, my email will also be at the end. And if I say anything in here that you, you, if you want a copy of these slides or other information, people can contact me afterwards. But here's a little, um, another little video. I hope you guys can all hear it about um, hearing voices and how they can be understood. Have you ever heard whispers as you drift off to sleep? I heard someone calling your name only to find there is nobody there. Up to one in 10 of us will hear a voice or sound that no one else can hear at some point in our lives. This is what's called hearing voices. Doctors sometimes call these experiences auditory hallucinations, but some people prefer the term voice hearing. Some people who hear voices may have a mental health problem or a diagnosis like schizophrenia or psychosis. Others live well with their voices without ever needing psychiatric help. Some people hear voices that are derogatory, threatening, or command them to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Others hear voices that are comforting, or supportive, or just plain neutral. The voices can be very real to the person who has them, even though they aren't shared by others. For some people, they can be difficult to distinguish from everyday conversation. For others, it's not like an experience of sound, but more like an experience of thoughts that are not your own. Voices don't always speak clearly, or even use language. Sometimes it isn't clear who the speaker is, but sometimes the speaker is a specific individual or character. Some people hear voices in parts of their body, and sometimes voice hearing is accompanied by sensations such as feeling hot or tingling in the hands and feet. Hearing voices can be triggered by many things, including traumatic events, major life changes, fear of danger, lack of sleep, extreme hunger, drugs and stress. One thing that people sometimes find difficult is not being able to control when the voices speak. For others, it's what the voices say that is upsetting. People use lots of different strategies to help them cope. Listening to music, exercise, talking back to the voices, challenging what they say or setting aside time to focus on them, or going to hearing voices groups to connect with others who share similar experiences. People have lots of different ways of understanding or making sense of voices. 
Some are happy to view their voices as symptoms of an illness. Others see them as meaningful spiritual experiences or linked to creative processes such as writing, making music or other artistic pursuits. Most people's experience and understanding of hearing voices changes over time as their circumstances change. But most voice hearers and researchers agree on two things. That the voice is not under their control and that the voice is not just random sound but often seems to have something to communicate. While some people certainly experience voices that are disruptive and distressing and would rather be without them, others see voices as an important part of their identity and sense of self. No two voices are the same. Yeah, the, the, the diversity is, is pretty incredible. And, and, um, and, and the voices people hear and how people relate to them. And one of the things is like how did, um, you were talking about internal family systems. Like, and some people would ask, well, our voices always represent parts of ourselves. And it's not necessarily, I mean, sometimes they seem more to represent our worries about what others might be. And so sometimes, you know, like um, a person might hear a, a voice that's of a relative that's kind of like absent and it's their thoughts and worries about what that relative might be thinking, or, or they might hear, you know, neighbors and it's, it's more like their thoughts and worries about what the neighbors might be thinking. Um, so I wanna say a little bit about, um, you know, force and treatment. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, like when people are, are psychotic, they're in the middle of trying to do something which might be dangerous to themselves or others. And we might feel like, well, we really need to use some force. But um, a problem with, with force when we don't need it, like I, I, I would say, you know, if we use it only to the minimum that is absolutely necessary to maybe save somebody. But the problem is that confrontation and force makes people feel unsafe and not in control, which then can exacerbate psychosis. So it can be counterproductive. That's why when possible, using general or dialogical approaches, I think are a lot more effective. Now, one thing that might get you to reflect on some of the current ways force is used is this slide here, which was um, Indigo Dio, you know, talks about, well, strange men come into my home, they make me go away with them, they take me to a scary place I can't get out, take off all my clothes, they force me to take drugs, they hurt me and there's nothing I can do to stop it. I mean, it sounds both like what might happen to someone when they're being kidnapped and sexually abused, and it sounds like being put in a mental hospital. Um, the, the loss of control um, can obviously be incredibly traumatizing and even worse so to someone who's been sexually abused before and then gets put into this kind of system. Um, so, you know, there are people trying to figure out how to make hospitals less traumatizing, um, but I think it's something that, you know, we need to put a lot more effort into once we recognize the connection between trauma and mental health symptoms. And we need to work on finding much more collaborative ways of working with people. Um, now, so recently there is um, some, some work done on trying to find out what's the most effective therapy approach for people that have a lot of um, you know, paranoid beliefs, beliefs or what's called paranoid delusions. And they actually found you know, that they didn't even really need to talk a lot specifically about specific paranoid beliefs, but work on some of the things that seem to be feeding into it. Like one thing is just people that didn't know how to control their worry, just teaching people how to control their worry or people that had lost all sense of self-confidence. So they felt like they couldn't stand up to anybody and they felt terrified of everybody, but just helping them build their self-confidence or they had voices and they didn't know how to handle them or they just didn't know how to sleep. Remember I mentioned the, the woman who quit marijuana and then she had insomnia. <laughs> you know, well, if you help people sleep, that can really help reduce delusional beliefs. And then the, the fifth one is, it's called defense behaviors. But that, what that means is people that kind of like retreat from life in order to defend themselves, but then now they're stuck kind of not being able to get on with their life. And the fact that they're hiding away makes everything seem more scary. So you might have somebody thinks, oh, my neighbors are after me. 
So then they always stay inside away from their neighbors, but now they're not getting on with their life and they never find out that maybe their neighbors are not that dangerous. So if you can, they could help people, um, you know, just try to step out and just try to say, hey, maybe there's a way you can move on with your life and do things. Maybe it's, you're not in such danger anymore. And, you know, they, and in this study in England, they, and in just about 20 sessions, half the people quit having, even though they often many of them had paranoid beliefs for a long time, they quit having enough of a paranoid belief to be causing them, it wasn't causing them trouble anymore. They mostly had dropped the belief and were getting on with their lives. And another quarter got some help. And then unfortunately one quarter wasn't helped because unfortunately in psychology, usually the stuff we do never works for everybody. People are too different. That doesn't mean we should give up on the people that the method didn't help. They might have needed something else. <laughs> but, but anyway, that was a very substantial um, kind of helping. Um, another thing that just helps is just help people feel like what's going on with them is maybe not that much different than what's going on with everybody else. So like, let's say, you know, um, a lot of us have at least some paranoia at some time or hearing voices, you know, like, you know, maybe 10% have like maybe a, a people have at least a substantial episode of voice hearing in their life. Um, and what's going on might be caused by many everyday factors. Well, maybe it's that you weren't sleeping. Maybe it's that you were stressed. Maybe it's, you know, there were emotions you didn't know what to do with. Um, but, to tell people see that maybe it's kind of like similar to what a lot of people go through. Like maybe the person is having a voices that berate them and that feels really weird. They don't know anyone else that has a voice that berates them. But if the person can reflect that what's well, what everybody has an internal critic that berates them, maybe it's not that much different. Maybe some of the same coping ideas can work. Well, now the person doesn't feel so freaked out. Um, so that idea that maybe there's a way to cope and maybe there's things you can learn that will help you cope better can really um, help people. And then also look at the possible positive side of, of what's going on. Um, like, um, I mean, sometimes people find something spiritual in the way their mind is, is reorganizing itself. Sometimes it might be just that the voices keep the person company or something like that. Um, so sometimes you have to help the person say, well, maybe there's something positive about it, but there's also something negative. And so like if the voices are keeping you company, but maybe they're not helping you get on with your life, maybe you could say, well, you know, maybe it's, you know, and this is something they do in the hearing voices movement. They set appointments for the voices and at other times have the vo voices move on to the back burner so they can get on with their life. And that way they kind of have the best, best of both worlds. Um, another perspective I found helpful, this, this one comes from Mark Twain, as he wrote at one point, let us consider that we are all partially insane. It will explain us to each other. It will unriddle many riddles. It will make clear and simple many things which are involved in haunting and harassing difficulties and obscurities now. So, you know, like if instead of you know, making the sharp distinction, some of us are sane and others are insane. Well, maybe we're all kind of partly insane and we've got, you know, mixed up, you know, even we don't even know our own insanities yet because we, you know, think maybe we've got it figured out, but then we realize we don't. But that kind of puts everybody on the same playing field. A lot of my clients have found that helpful because if you're sitting here, if you've been called insane and everyone else is over here sane, can feel really hard to cross over. But if your sense is like, well, hey, maybe everybody's at least a bit crazy and maybe I've gotten kind of way over there <laughs> to some extent, but I don't need to totally become perfectly sane. I just need to, you know, maybe ease off on some things and, <laughs> and regroup a little and maybe I'll be like everybody else. It's partly insane. Then maybe we can get on with things. Um, it's, it's a helpful perspective, I think. So finally, one more quick video. Um, and this one is on um, bringing compassion into relationship with, with voice hearing, which I think, because kindness, I think, is really key to good treatment. And, um, and this kind of it just shows the way that can work. 
This is a film about Stuart. <sighs> Stuart and his voices. You can't do Football it. today. Brush your teeth. No way. Football. Get up, useless. These circles represent our three major emotion systems and how they are balanced. The threat system kicks in. They're coming for you. They've set you up. They know what you've done. They'll lock you up and never let you out. You might as well give up now. much. It's all too much. Pathetic. <laughs> Stuart's drive system comes online. Come on. Come on, Stuart. They don't want you in the team. Miss. Go on, miss. <laughs> Stuart is starting a therapy to help him cultivate compassion for himself, his feelings and his voices. Weak. You're weak for seeking therapy. You're weak. Be a man. Walk away. Don't trust her. Over time, Stuart's therapist gradually helps him to feel more safe. They practice exercises that help him feel more grounded and still. Slowing down his body using breathing and imagery, activating his soothing system. Stuart develops an image of an ideal, compassionate person, focusing on each of its compassionate qualities. He tries to imagine what it would be like to step into this image and become this compassionate person. He walks around, acting the part of his compassionate self, getting a sense of what that would feel like, how he would think, what he would do. He practices at home as well, and gradually begins to deepen his understanding and sense of his compassionate self. As Stuart feels safer, stronger, and more courageous, he decides to start a conversation from his compassionate self to his most critical voice. Hello. What do you want, loser? I want to understand you. I want to help you feel safe. Safe? Nothing's safe around here. If it wasn't for me, you'd be... I know you're trying to help me. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that I get scared. You're right, I do. But I want to start overcoming my fears now. I'm ready. You want to get rid of me? No, I don't. I don't want to get rid of anyone. We can work on this together. Hearing voices is a common human experience. It can often be linked to something difficult or painful that's happened in the past. Although tricky at times, with lots of practice and encouragement, Stuart's compassionate self becomes better developed. Danger! Back to bed. You're not ready. It's okay, guys. Thanks for the warning. I'll keep an eye out, but there's things I need to do today. Um, uh, oh. hey, it's all right, we can manage this. We'll see. Hey! Stuart now feels safe in relation to his voices. He understands and accepts them. They're very much part of the family, but no longer running the show. With his compassionate self in the driving seat, Stuart can now follow his true desires. Yeah, so um, the, this video is made by people 
practice um, compassion-focused therapy, which has got a lot of similarities to internal family systems. But the idea is if you can access and activate the part of you that can be compassionate towards all the parts of yourself, um, that that often allows you to get to that point like where you're not letting the voices or the parts drive the car, but yet you're able to let them be part of the family and let them have their view and make their contribution, but not, not get pushed around by them, which is sort of like what you saw Stuart learning to do. Basic idea. Um, yeah, and so one of the, one of the, the ideas sure, is that um, the parts of our mind that um, like kind of like get way out there into these, you know, uh, whether it's it's voices or really different ways of, of looking at the world are not necessarily bad, but it's bad if we get lost in them. So like on this slide, when we get on that far right into what's being called emotion mind or non-shared reality, we can get lost. But at the same time, we're not meant to to try to get rid of that part, it's a valued part of us. It's just that we want to also be able to keep a foot in what's here called reasonable mind or ordinary thinking or shared reality. And it's actually when we're in touch with both sides of ourselves that our minds are functioning best or what they call wise mind. Um, so anyway, that's some overall perspective on this topic. And um, um, again, you can, um, we have a little time for some question and answer if anybody has anything. And um, also you can email me. We, we have, it'll start up again in the fall, uh, a group that meets once a month to talk about psychological approaches to psychosis and go over. So you can get on the email list for that. Um, and so here again is my email address or you can check out my blog. Or um, you can also, um, if anybody's interested in the hearing voices and different realities discussion and support group, um, that is there too. Um, I see somebody has something in, you know, somebody has uh, a question. What do we do when we as our parents are accused and what seems like our son's delusions of doing seriously wrong things that we never did? Our son says we attempted to kill him. Yeah, that can be a really um, distressing kind of situation. Um, one thing I, I would suggest, I mean, we, we want to try to, it, it's really hard to bring a calm mind to something like that, but uh, it would be important to, you know, like I can imagine if I was in that situation to um, try to like, wow, um, this sounds different than what I recall, but why don't you tell me what, what you remember? And then if, you know, if my, if I had a son and my son started talking about, you know, something that I, I didn't remember, I'd sound like, that sounds like a really distressing event. Um, it's not what I remember happening. So um, either there's something really wrong with me that I don't remember it, or it happened in another dimension, or it's a, uh, you know, maybe, you know, you know, what could be happening, what, you know, and just be willing to talk about it and try to, in a friendly way, I wouldn't lose, you know, pretend to believe something I didn't, but try to be um, kind and calm, even in the, the face of that and not, one thing you really don't want to get into is being critical and hostile and all fired up because that just tends to create, um, more of a mess. <laughs> people, people who are around people who are really critical of them and hostile. That tends to, you know, drive them further into extreme states and psychosis. Yeah. I wonder if like people, like the people that respond better to medication, um, have a better or uh, are more receptive to living life with the medication. Or because I I have two friends that both are like borderline schizophrenic. And one of them is very like adverse to medication and uh has found tons of different ways to live his life. They're both like incredibly emotive, um talented. And he's he's found like ritualistic and spiritual ways to deal with his uh 
uh, experience. And my other friend had, has had like way more severe um, psychoses that he, he didn't have the choice to deal with. It's not even on medication, and he's very happy with it. Uh, so I just wonder if like his his basic beliefs sort of like didn't give him any like agency to deal with, sort of find that middle ground between his um, feelings and uh, feelings and, and thoughts. And so he um, he's very happy about his medication. Um, and yeah, so I wonder if like that's part of like when you were talking about the 25% of people who met and it didn't help them at all. Mm -hmm. Like those are the people that are just like yeah it's 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 a tricky question of like why some people respond and some people don't and of course i mean i mean some people can be really distressed and then they let's say they take the medication and it just doesn't help that can happen too um and i don't think i think there's a lot we don't fully understand and it can also be different at different times like there might be one time in somebody's life where they're just so appreciative to have the medication is exactly what they need mm -hmm. but maybe later they've come to a place where they don't need it anymore um, so i certainly don't pretend to have all the answers and then there might be other people who think they've gotten to where they don't need it and they try to go down and it just doesn't work and they you know I mean, maybe it was there's something else that could have been done to help them, or you know, we we don't. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, this guy, this person in particular, was like very uh, has a lot of beliefs that rob him of his like agency, like a lot of uh, like negative thinking, and has this character of himself that they always talk about that uh, is always like me and my friend are both. So. Better than this person. So, yeah, that's fine. Um, let's see, anybody else online have any questions? Or, Tony, do you have any? Well, I, I sort of want to respond to that. I think that some people are sick fits and they're in And other people are willing to do the work to it. And I think that's how many people decide what they're going to do if they're just going to stay in medication. And then what I found is a lot of people are on medication for various things and they're afraid to get off the medication because some of the symptoms will come back. And, then, and they haven't done the work to figure out what is underneath the symptoms. Really? It's like Ron said, it can be childhood trauma, it can be in your life in so way. So, you know, what's your way of living in the world? Especially, I mean, their symptoms in particular are very scary and like mm -hmm. life threatening. So, mm -hmm. so I totally understand the response. And yes, yeah, so it's hard to find that middle ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like the medical model, the first thing the doctors are offering is well, at least for set, and you know, they didn't know what's wrong with me. I had arthritis. Uh, it was, well, we'll give you this medication, you know, they'll just have to take it tomorrow. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. If I change my attitude, if I change my diet, if I change my exercise, I think it'll make a difference. And the doctors, and I agree that I would do that for a year. If I didn't get better, I would take the pills. But I'm not better. Because I want, I didn't want to take those, and I want to make a change that way. So I think there's that hopefulness in the way to be more. Because it wasn't easy. Thanks a lot for coming. And uh, if you support more of these uh, LCC and mental health events, if they happen. <laughs> yeah.